die to shake hands. Okay. European presidency. Thanks. Thank you very much. Grazie tante. Okay. Ah. Ciao, grazie. <ride> Un esclusivo. Pronti. Bene, vi prego di prendere posto. Uh, so if you need the earphone, headphone, headphone. Ecco, vi prego di prendere posto che veramente cominciamo in qualche istante, il tempo anche di dare ai nostri ospiti di orientarsi su questo palco. Uh, we will be starting in a few minutes uh, just to allow our guests to wear their headsets for simultaneous translation. In the past 30 years the meeting has accompanied the, the world's history, the great protagonists of the world's history have been among us. Um, we've looked at all continents, all cultures, all uh, populations in order to get to know each other and become friends. It is the vocation of the meeting. Some years ago, a group of uh, friends from Rimini met uh, in a pizzeria and were appeal were attracted by the idea of organizing uh, a meeting uh, for the friendship among peoples. It seems strange that we've gone so far, yet the meeting is uh, the um, expression of uh, friendship uh, as uh, Father Giussani wanted it to be. At this opening uh, meeting of the 30th edition of the Rimini meeting, we um, have to remember our um, history. Over the past years, uh, we found many friends, but one of the dearest friends of ours is Honorable Franco Frattini. As you know, he is the minister foreign affairs in Italy. The protocol uh, requires that I introduce him like this, but uh, I would like to welcome him as a true friend. Thanks to him at the meeting, we've uh, had a number of uh, interesting uh, discussions and debates. Um, I remember, for example, uh, the meeting between uh, the uh, foreign minister of Israel and the uh, minister of the Palestinian Authority. They met after one year. They had not seen he each other. And it is thanks to him that we can open the meeting with this uh, um, session uh, that has uh, that is quite unprecedented. The um, President of the European Union and all the representatives from um, the African countries. Mauro Mauro is actually the person who uh, drove uh, the shortest distance to come here. But we're all here together with uh, Minister Frattini to discuss Africa, its conflicts, its hopes, uh, and the challenge that Africa represents for the developed world, the help that we can give them, and how we can provide aid to Africa. Discussion is always uh, very hot on these uh, issues. When we talk about Africa, there are many stereotypes. I'm sure that uh, the direct dialogue will unveil a lot of surprises. The year 2009 is the year of Africa, the journey of the Pope, the G8, today's meeting, and the forthcoming Bishop's Synod, and also the 
meeting, and once again, the meeting is a companion of the rest of the world. So welcoming, in welcoming all our guests, or rather friends today who have traveled long distances to come here, I would like to first invite the um, Secretary of um, Foreign Affairs of the Republic of San Marino, Mrs. Mularoni, to welcome all of us. We have a problem with the sound. We're waiting for instructions from the sound engineers, as people say in the news. Then please come here and use this microphone. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. First of all, let me welcome the um, people here at the meeting in Rimini from the Republic of San Marino. Right from the beginning um, of the meeting uh, that is celebrating its 30th anniversary, the Republic of uh, San Marino has always cooperated with the organizers of the meeting. I'd like to welcome, um, I would like to wish them all success also for this edition. Well, um, concerning Africa, it's not just the conflicts uh, that are forgotten. It is the whole continent that is forgotten. On average, there seems to be little interest um, in uh, the topics um, which relate to this continent, which is the closest uh, to ours. The only things that we hear from the news is the immigrants, the illegal immigrants coming to our country. The Africa is a huge and diversified country. There are countries that have made tremendous steps forward in terms of democracy and protection of human rights and freedom. Other countries have not made the same steps in this direction. Some of them have even made steps back. They are still full of conflicts which are so difficult to understand for us Europeans. My country has always tried to help Africa and the current government is also doing this. We've always supported the African country and its, um, uh, the African countries and their cause at international level. We've always supported initiatives undertaken by organizations, not for profit organizations or individuals, to develop certain activities. And we have supported humanitarian activities in the African continent. We entertain diplomatic relations with just a small number of African countries, so it's hard for us to know what is happening in those countries. We, it's hard for us to understand the dynamics behind these events. On October the 1st in San Marino, we will have um, as our guest at a ceremony which is followed very much by all citizens, uh, the Director General of FAO. This will be a great opportunity to discuss the issues of poverty in Africa and what the so-called developed world can do in order to help this wonderful country go through the road of development, uh, which is combined uh, with peace, uh, democracy, stability, respect uh, for in the individual rights and the people's rights. Uh, today's debate is certainly a great opportunity for me and my country to know more about the events uh, of the African country, of the African continent. Uh, the, uh, actually, listening to certain um, uh, events uh, from those that experience them every day will help us uh, know what to do to help uh, countries uh, 
that are ridden by conflicts uh, which seem to be never ending. Uh, the contribution that can be made by each one of us may seem to be like a drop of water in the ocean. And this is even more true for San Marino, considering the size of my country. Nevertheless, uh, the drops of water often give meet meaning to our lives. In the case of San Marino, which is a country that has no military uh, weight, can nevertheless make its contribution to peace, development, and democracy. It is in this spirit that I am eager to listen to the speakers, um, and we are I can ensure to you that we are ready to support uh, your commitments in this direction. Thank you. Now, before giving the floor to Minister Frattini, I'd like to introduce these guests and friend, friends of ours. The um, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Sweden and President of the European Union, Karl Bildt, a man of great experience at international level, um, the Vice President of Sierra Leone, Sam Sumana, the Prime Minister of Kenya, Raila Odinga, the Bernard Camillo Spenberg, the Foreign Minister of Tanzania. The Minister for Security in Uganda, Amanda Mambasi. Mario Mauro, we already mentioned him. I think you all would like to welcome him with an applause. These friends and guests from abroad traveled long distances. Some of them came just a few minutes ago. They come from countries that we partly know through friends that have worked and lived in those countries for many years. We're linked to them by deep affection. Other countries we will learn to love today. As you can appreciate, this is a great opportunity and a great event opening this meeting. In any case, Your Excellencies, we're all eager to listen to you. And now the floor to Minister Frattini. Thank you. Well, thank you from deep in my heart. I'm back among friends. Some time ago, I said to the president of meeting, but I'd like to repeat this in front of so many friends in Rimini, that the speakers we have today have come from long distances. They honor us with their presence both from uh, Africa and Europe. Uh, we really regard the meeting as uh, part of Italy, as part of our country. Through meetings like this, uh, we think we can really make a great uh, contribution to the political world. Uh, and this is um, true also considering the first meeting uh, that was held 30 years ago, as Mr. Fontolan uh, said. Now, a couple of words about this uh, session. Why are we here to talk about Africa? Because of the reasons uh, that were already mentioned and that are clear to everybody. If we look at the international scenario today, I think we can uh, say 
with certainty that Africa is the paradigm, the clearest example of the challenges that we have to face in the 21st century. It is certainly the paradigm of the challenge for sustainable development. It is the best example of the need to give voice to the most vulnerable and the poorest among the populations. We really have to look at the human dimension of this economic downturn. We've often talked about GDP, about inflation mechanisms, about recession. But we have not sufficiently highlighted the fact that this economic downturn affects millions of people millions of human beings who suffer poverty and Africa is for sure a continent where the human dimension of this crisis is increasingly to be studied, investigated and challenged. Essentially, we're faced with a major problem. It's an institutional, a political, and an ethical problem ahead of us. When we talk about Africa, we talk about man's life on Earth. We talk about the conditions for the very dignity, the growth and development of human beings. This is why this encounter, this meeting, is um, a very important one. Certainly, Africa is also the continent of um, forgotten conflicts. It is uh, something um, that our speakers will certainly refer to. These are not uh, traditional uh, wars or conflicts uh, between uh, states. Uh, even if conventional conflicts uh, took place in Africa too, causing enormous tragedies. We're talking about conflicts uh, which are um, there under the ashes, uh, so to say. They affect the daily lives uh, of uh, millions of people, and yet uh, they do not deserve uh, headlines in the papers. Uh, or they don't uh, generate uh, big news uh, on television, yet they are the sources of uh, tragedies. Uh, think of Darfur, think of Chad, think of the terrible uh, situations uh, which uh, occur in Somaliland uh, with the continuous attacks uh, that the government is uh, with which the government is continuously trying to react. These are forgotten conflicts. They uh, feed organized crime, drug trafficking, weapon trafficking. And these conflicts are also linked to the development of dramatic phenomena. Piracy, for example, think of the pirates off the coasts of Somalia. These problems um, are solved only if you go at the roots of the problems. Uh, sometimes I say that the problem of piracy in Somalia should be solved uh, on um, earth and not at sea by patrolling the uh, coasts of the Gulf of Aden. Um, these conflicts um, bring about violations uh, to the fundamental rights uh, of mankind. Think, for example, of children uh, that are the true victims of conflicts uh, which involve uh, entire ethnic groups and populations. Think of the mass violence against women. Think of the eth ethical cleansing operations. These are important aspects in the forgotten conflicts that the international press does not consider very much. So the duty of the institutions 
and the duty of the civil society, the duty of the people who, like you, are volunteers also in Africa, should always repeat to themselves that we can't forget these conflicts affecting many people. It's not numbers, it's people that are affected while we're here speaking in this beautiful city of Rimini. We have to talk about specific topics, but also solutions. I talked about Somalia. We have to really address this topic with a joint commitment by the international community. There are countries in Africa, and one is represented here by its prime minister, that is the Republic of Kenya, were countries that are looking for a solution with the international community, a solution to the problems of Somalia. The problems are problems of poverty. There's also a lack of reconciliation among the different groups inside the country. Extremists, fundamentalists have penetrated the country, and terrorists are there too. Africa is familiar with these problems, but it is a duty for us to deal with these problems. And I'm saying this in front of Karl Bildt, a dear colleague of mine who's highly committed to this. Europe must not only speak with a single voice concerning Somalia. As the presidency suggested, we have to um, appoint a special envoy, European envoy to Somalia, someone who is constantly a reference point representing the 27 small Mid, medium-sized and large member states of the European Union. I've got some messages to convey to you for additional reflections. First of all, dear friends of Africa, the future, your future, your destiny is first of all in your hands. It's not we from the West or from Europe that should force you to go in a certain direction. The ownership of your future is in your hands. And the second message is a message that should come from developed countries such as Italy. Africa must not be left alone in this process, as was also said at the G8 summit in L'Aquila. The G8 summit gave a signal of innovation and considerable change in this direction. We cannot withdraw ourselves from the commitment of providing aid also economic aid to Africa. We can't say we can't help Africa simply because there is a crisis worldwide. There is a crisis worldwide, but you have to understand that the poorest countries suffer even more from this crisis. And the duty of the industrialized countries is not to leave Africa alone in such a difficult period of time. This means providing public aid to Africa, but also providing opportunities to Africa for world trade. In L'Aquila, we decided that the negotiations for international trade the so-called DOA negotiations have to come to a change. We have to support trade without barriers so that African countries have greater opportunities for trade and can participate in the world commercial scenario. In L'Aquila, we promised $20 billion for a three-year food program. 
in order to solve the problem, the main problem, um, that is the problem of hunger. One billion people risk or run the risk of starvation. Uh, this problem is not far away from us. It is a problem that we must feel as our own problem. And the G8 summit, for the first time, said that Africa should be part of the decision-making process. At the G8 summit, the African representatives were not there simply to listen, but they also participated. The African leaders participated in the debates as political subjects. And this is my third message. Africa does not need our charity. Africa needs to be regarded as an important political counterpart at international level. And together with Africa, we must make decisions on the basis of the principle of equality. We have to overcome the old concept of rich countries donating money to African countries that are simply the recipients of these financial aids. Africa must be part of major international decisions, starting from the reform of the UN, the reform of the Security Council, and also partnership initiatives such as the one instituted in 2007 together with Africa. Fourthly, Africa must be an Africa of rights and opportunities. As was said, Africa will be the paradigm of a challenge where or a challenge which is particularly dear to me and to the Italian government. It's the challenge for the rights. Well, if there is um, poverty, if there is no global governance, then the dignity of millions of people is at risk. Climate change is uh, maybe a weapon of mass destruction. We have to avoid that they become a weapon of mass destruction. We have to do something about the climate changes because they um, put the African country, the African continent at uh, great risk. Usually we hear about Africa only in relation to illegal immigrants. It would be wrong to only think of those desperate people reaching the coasts of Sicily. These people are not happy to leave their homeland. They're desperate. They are starving. That's why they leave their countries uh, to come to Italy or Europe. We have a duty, which is that of helping those whose life is in danger. This is a moral duty that we all have. And the second duty we have is to consider the problem of migration as a European problem. Migration is not an Italian problem or a problem of Malta. It's a problem of Europe as a whole. The other side of the coin is to avoid that these flows of desperation continue. We have to increase local development. We have to invest in agricultural projects. We have to uh, reduce the cost of remittances by migrants who pay 10% in order to send their wages back home to their families. We have to improve the situation in order to affect the factors which determine the migration flows. Africa must be must focus on education. We don't need 
baby soldiers. We need uh, children who go to school. I found managing classes in Africa that are highly qualified and educated. I found university projects in which Italy participates and is highly convinced of this. Africa and women, women who are the victims of mass violences and ethnic cleansing. I found a lot of support among colleagues from many countries that are here represented, African countries that will support an Italian initiative, that is to start an action at the General Assembly of the UN to abolish the genital mutilations of the young girls. This is my last message. Many people referred to Afro-pessimism the Africa of wars, of violence, but we have to reject this. Uh, we have to turn Africa into a great, extraordinary opportunity. Thank you very much. Allora, ora vorrei dare la parola al Presidente Carbi. The next speaker is Carl Bild, President of the European Union and Minister of Sweden. Please. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for this um, opportunity not only to come here but also to be able to address the issues of Africa. Much too seldom do we put them at the forefront of the debates about global issues but they are profoundly important, not the least from the European point of view. As um, I think Franco Fattini indicated, of course these issues are very important for us Europeans. Africa is our immediate neighbor. What happens there affects us. It also presents us with big global opportunities. We are the by far biggest trading partner of the countries of Africa. We are even more dominant when it comes to official development aid and help to the struggles against poverty in Africa. And together with the United Nations, we are engaged in peace and security operations in different parts of the continent. And of course, bonds of history, for better or worse, are stronger between Europe and Africa than between Africa and any other part of the world. I think what reaches in the news media concerning Africa is often the problems. That's the way news media operate. But if you look at the last decade or so, it's been fairly good for Africa. It has had economic growth in the order of 6% a year. We've seen globalization starting to lift the economies of quite a number of the countries. We've seen the number of conflicts, as a matter of fact, going down in spite of the problems that are there. And uh, what we've also seen is progress in the critically important area of governance. We now have more than half of the countries of Africa having being on a democratic path of governance. But very much remains to be done in the years to come. And I think what will happen in Africa will depend on essentially Africa's ability to move forward in two different areas, on the path of democratic governance and on the path of economic transformation. By 2025, there will be roughly further 350 million people south of the Sahara, making a total of roughly 1 billion people enormous demographic pressures. At the same time, as Frank also pointed out, we will begin to see the effects of climate change if we don't manage to stop that, affecting primarily food production. In fact, Sub-Saharan Africa is the part of the world most in danger if we don't manage to halt 
the process of global warming. There are estimates that this could leave more than 200 million more Africans short of water, and that farmers in Africa that rely on rain for their agriculture can see declines in their yields by up to 50 percent in a couple of decades. Those Copenhagen critically important for the future of Africa, and you can trust on the active green diplomacy of the European Union to do whatever we can to address that problem, but obviously we require also a constructive contribution from Africa itself. Related to this, there is a need for a second green revolution that will increase the yields of farming in Africa. This will require better policies but also investments in new techniques, as well as infrastructures to facilitate a move towards more efficient systems of food production in large parts of Africa. And here the European Union has made very large commitment. We have allocated a billion euro for food security in Africa during the coming three years to the benefit of the countries directly, but also NGOs and international organizations that can help in this very important endeavor, important for Africa, but for all of the world. We need to increase global food production by roughly 50 percent in the coming decades to handle the different challenges that we have. We will also address the economic and trade challenges. Frank alluded to that as well from the discussions in Aquila. The slump in the global economy must be arrested. Africa will still have growth this year roughly 1.5 percent, and we hope that we'll be rebound next year. But demography means, of course, that this is not enough. Again, the European Union will be at the forefront of the international in effort, but Africa needs to reform itself. It is a rather sad fact that if you look along around the regions of the world, the one region where the climate for business is the least good is sub-Saharan Africa. But by saying that, I also want to say that if you look at the World Bank list of the 10 best reformers last year, we do have three African countries there. We do have Senegal, we have Burkina Faso, we have Botswana. And we should also note that there are three post-crisis countries that are particularly difficult, Liberia, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone, that are making fast progress in creating a better environment for economic development. And let's also say that since the situation in the global continent is so bad in Africa, you can say that the potential for change for the better is bigger in Africa than anywhere else. Much can be done and it can produce effects. Let me just mention that African countries don't trade very much with each other. More limited regional trade than anywhere else in the world. While if you look at the experience of Europe, or now the experience of Asia, regional trade is really something that lifts continents up. Much, much can be done. And all of this is doable, fighting global warming, paving the way for second green revolution, getting globalization back on track, making a leap forward in economic reforms and regional integration can be done by Africa with the help of the European Union and the rest of the international community. But we know that this is not enough. There are critically difficult conflicts that need to be addressed. They need to be addressed for the conflicts themselves and the people that are directly affected. But also because of there's the risk that if we don't do that, an otherwise positive development in the rest of Africa will be negatively affected by it. And all of the work that we there do there will be put to naught. There's a process of state erosion in parts of West Africa that has worrying long-term implications, not the least, by the way, from the uh, European point of view, migration, smuggling, illicit trade, and other effects. We're all aware of the acute challenges in the entire region of the Horn of Africa. Somalia is very high up, as Franco said, on the European Union agenda at the moment. We must recognize that the future of Sudan, which is the largest country of all of Africa, will be at stake in the next two, three years. 
and we have a huge interest in the outcome of that. We know that the Great Lakes region, scene of so many tragedies, remains very fragile and will demand our attention. And we must not forget self-imposed humanitarian tragedies, Zimbabwe profoundly failed policies by that regime that has led to humanitarian catastrophe for that country that must not be forgotten either. But if we do all of this, the bigger issues that I mentioned, that we help with the role of Africa itself and the African Union as an important partner, increasingly so, from the side of the European Union, if we do all of this, I think that we should not be concentrated only on the negative headlines of the problems of Africa in the media, but we should see the potential that is there. It's a country that is rich not primarily in natural resources, that's important as well, in farming opportunities for the future, but it has an enormous human potential and human richness that could be mobilized and should be mobilized for the benefit of Africa itself, but also, let's be somewhat egoistic, for the benefit of Europe. We are the number one partners of Africa. We are the closest neighbors of Africa. We can benefit hugely from helping Africa achieve the success that is very clearly possible. So thank you, and I have to say that uh, being in the presidency of the European Union means that you need to do everything at the same time. So unfortunately, I will have to leave for further engagement just in a couple of minutes. But thank you for the possibility of giving you some remarks on a vitally important subject. Thank you very much, President Bildt, for the picture, all the information that he has provided us with. He has provided us with very useful food for thought. And as he has said, unfortunately, we'll have to leave soon. So ha safe journey home and goodbye. And now the floor to the president uh, of Sierra Leone, Sam Sumana, one of the African countries, Sierra Leone, which is showing good results in terms of development. So please, Mr. Deputy President, and thank you very much for being here with us. Mr. Chairman, Your Excellencies, heads of government, religious leaders, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you greetings and felicitations from my president, Dr. Ernest Baikroma, the government and the people of Sierra Leone. Mr. Chairman, let me first of all thank the organizers and volunteers of Remini meeting for inviting Sierra Leone to fully participate as an integral component of this family of nations assembled here in Rimini, Italy for mutual benefit and cooperation in world affairs. It is gratifying to note that some leaders of African states are present at this meeting. This medium will accord us the opportunity to focus and analyze the state situation in our continent vis-a-vis -vis Africa's forgotten conflicts. Conflicts have occurred in Africa since the 1970s with the 1990s witnessing a rise in internal conflicts. Some conflicts received little international attention and were hardly reported in the mainstream media despite their severity and intensity. While most of the conflicts in Africa have moved towards re resolution and peace consolidation, as in Mozambique, Sierra Leone, Ivory Coast, Liberia, Angola, for example, there are protracted conflicts in Africa, such as in Somalia, Southern Sudan, Northern Uganda, Democratic Republic of Congo, Southern Morocco, Chad, etc., that receive minimal media coverage and international attention compared to the conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, and between Israel and Palestine. It could be acknowledged that in some cases in Africa, the victims of the conflicts were largely hidden. 
thus limiting early public knowledge about the conflict as in Darfur and Central African Republic. The under on reporting of the conflicts and lost their international intervention to some extent has contributed in creating the environmental and protraction, escalation of violence and difficulties in negotiating peaceful situation. The geopolitical interests of Western powers, social and environmental, as well as governance issues have exhibited the situation. While it is true that the media plays a role to report these wars, how much coverage is given to the real issues of these wars remains debatable. But suffice it to say that there are the silent sufferers and the unaddressed issues, raped women, abducted children, child soldiers, homeless and internally displaced people, transitional justice, reparation, harm smuggling and human trafficking, which the media is yet to report more on. These conflicts can thus be referred to as Africa's forgotten conflicts. The reasons for under on reporting are varied, but it could be surmised that as influencing factors in the little influence, some of these conflicts have on the Western media and societies. However, in this era of globalization with improved communications and transport leaks worldwide, the potential to transfer the effects of conflicts so far away countries remain high. The increased volume of refugees from Africa seeking to enter Europe through Spain and Italy is a pointer. The role of Somali pirates in the Gulf of Aden speaks of the influence these conflicts can exert on the international trade and on the global economy if not checked. Furthermore, geopolitical interests, especially in the new era of globalization, have become a factor which determines the degree of coverage and international response to individual conflicts. For instance, the role of certain non-African governments supporting the government in Chad and the transitional government in Somalia is a clear manifestation of a geopolitical interest in on these non-African countries. While it is acknowledged that media coverage of the conflict in Sudan, DRC, and Somalia has increased in recent years, there are indications that these cannot be divorced also from the economic interest of the actors. Considering the human, physical, social, and economic impact of these conflicts on the African region, and the wider ex external communities, the need to continue to seek prudent solutions to address these conflicts cannot be overemphasized. History has demonstrated the positive effects of the dual approach of international reporting and intervention into the seeking resolutions to conflicts, even protracted ones. South Africa, Mozambique, Sierra Leone, and Liberia are some examples. Adopting this approach towards Africans forgotten critics is critical and crucial. It is evident in the Southern Sudan conflict that the scaling up of humanitarian assistance and international pressure to negotiate a peace settlement to the conflict is a contributory result of worldwide reporting by the media and the non-governmental organizations. Mr. Chairman, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the publicity of the atrocities committed in Sierra Leone civil war from 1991 to 2002 garnered worldwide public support, sympathy, and international effort beyond the West African sub-region to seek an end to the conflict. The role of the media in seeking justice saw the revolutionary United Front and its cronies, including former president of Liberia, Charles Taylor, being tried for war crimes by the Special Court for Sierra Leone sitting in the air. Conversely, under the reporting and delayed international intervention, efforts into conflicts could trigger disastrous consequences. Evidence has shown that there could be an upsurge in the severity and the intensity of the violence. Non-intervention could inadvertently signal to the conflict parties, the victims and the wider world, the international communities, to resolve the human tragedies in conflict. The delayed intervention by the international community into Rwanda's genocide in the 1990s unfolded the exposure of the unspeakable suffering of the thousands of Rwanda's war victims and the geopolitical interest in the conflict. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, addressing conflict has been problematic by itself. 
more so when parties to the conflict show little interest in resolving them. More often, this has led to isolation of these conflicts by countries and the international community. The failure to achieve sustained peace, the repeated cycle of violence, and the increased threat to the intervening parties could drain the resolve of the international community, thereby forcing it to withdraw from the conflict. Although this is understandable from a human perspective, it could however lead to isolation, as in Somalia, with undesirable consequences. Isolation involves limited official links with the rest of the world through, for example, diplomatic channels, air and sea transport links, commercial activities, educational exchanges, etc. However, this in itself has a tendency of creating a parallel state as seen in Somalia, where warlords have left the country in a perpetual state of chaos and violence. The circle of violence, which has stretched over many years, has unfortunately bred undesirable elements who have now threatened international trade and security through pirate activities beyond the Somali coast. The longer the war, the more difficult it becomes to negotiate a successful peace settlement and the higher the risk of breaking the peace accord. Some of the conflicts have stretched over 15 years. Western Sahara, 35 years. Sudan, 22 years. Somalia, 18 years. As the conflict protracts, warring factors become entrenched, establishing connections with illegal networks for tra trafficking drugs, minerals, and other necessary resources which help finance their activities. They seek to capture more territories and strengthen their bargaining power positions. During negotiations, they may find it difficult to shift from their positions unless where they are weakened militarily or through international pressure. A military solution where one party emerges victorious on the battlefront is less likely. Therefore, a negotiated settlement is mostly seen as the best approach. Complexity of the conflict increases when leakages with other aggrieved sectors of society, that being ethnic groups, minority groups, youths, women, religious sectors are established. Often splinter groups emerge, thus making it difficult to pinpoint a central command or leadership structures, thereby posing problems in negotiation. Somalia is a case in point with multiple warlords. Protraction of the conflict could also lead to the loss of public interest and of sympathy for the millions of victims in Africa that have been killed, maimed, orphaned, internally displaced, or who live as refugees within Africa or in other parts of the world. On the other hand, protraction could increase public sympathy and gather support for an end to the war. It is helpful to bear in mind that humanitarian fatigue is a real possibility, especially in the environment of competing problems, for example, global credit emergence. Africa's forgotten conflicts often trigger series of negative effects on the continent. Some of these include spillovers into neighboring countries and possible spread in the sub-region, humanitarian security risks to migrant refugee communities who might live in fear and want due to possible hostility. Increased risk of violation of the human, political, economic, and social rights of both refugees and migrants. Increased population puts a strain to, on access to social services, such as housing, education, water, health, etc., and on economic opportunities in most countries, thereby raising risk of tensions between host and migrant communities. Proliferation of small arms remains a high risk in the continent. Rising transitional criminal activities, including piracy and human and drug traffic. Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, Africa's forgotten conflict has posed serious challenges to our stability and growth. The role of the media in portraying these conflicts has remained contentious. Rebuilding a stable and progressive society after conflict requires huge input in human, 
and financial resources and commitment from all sectors. The longer-term problems of reversing the impact of the protracted wars in Africa warrant concerted efforts to address the several issues that emerge, principally those of conflict resolution, peace building, and, gov and governance through pursuit of early resolution to the conflict, reiteration of conflict countries to end isolation and strengthening of democratic principles in our country. Mr. Chairman, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. Molte grazie per questa approfondimento per questa riflessione. Thank you very much for this presentation on the topic of conflicts, possible way, ways out, and the many challenges that we have ahead of us. The next speaker is now the Prime Minister of Kenya, Mr. Raila Odinga. Please. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Mr. Fratini. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to begin by thanking the organizers for bringing us here, that is, African leaders, together with this very influential forum to discuss the situation in Africa in general and Africa's forgotten conflicts in particular. We Africans cannot or will not forget the devastating civil strife, political turmoil and armed conflicts that we have gone through. However, this topic is important because there is a risk that such conflicts could be forgotten by policy makers and citizens of the G8 and other rich countries as they are confronted with the most serious recession since the Great Depression. I am an Afro-optimist as opposed to Afro-pessimist. I believe in the ability of the African people to develop the African continent. It is now exactly 52 years since the first African country attained independence. That was the Gold Coast then, which became Ghana. Some other countries followed suit, and by early 60s, most countries in the African continent had become independent. Fifty years is a long time in history of a country or of a human being. Now, how does it come about that Africa, the richest continent in terms of resources, remains today the poorest in terms of development? The answer lies not in the colonial past, but in the way that Africa has been governed since independence. It's an issue of governance. At independence, several African countries inherited fairly democratic structures of governance. There were multi-party systems, clear separations of power between the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. But immediately after independence, a school of thought developed on the continent that multipartism was alien to traditional African society, that the traditional African society allowed for conflict resolution by way of consensus, and that the adversarial system of resolving conflict was strange to Africa. So the founding fathers of African independence, Cleodine Kwame Nkrumah, Modibo Keita, 
Sekoture, Levon Sengor, Malimu Nyerere, Jomo Kinyata. They argued very eloquently that the gigantic task of nation building required consolidation of efforts through a series of measures, coercion, blackmail, bribery, intimidation, the opposition was led into extinction. And with that went the checks and balances in the system. What followed was a single party dictatorship. Later on, in some countries, military dictatorships. There are no checks and balances. As a result of this, corruption became the order of the day. Nepotism, tribalism took the center stage. So the African people were forced once again to struggle for what is now known as the second liberation of Africa. In the era of the Cold War, it did, it did not matter how you were running your country. If you came out as an African leader and said that you are an ally of the West in the war against communism, nobody cared how you are running your country. That is how we created monsters like Mobuto Sezeseko, Idi Amin Dada, Kamuzu Banda of Africa. So this was a very dark era in the African continent. It, it was only after the fall of the Berlin Wall that the wind of change began to blow in the continent of Africa. <laughs> that wind of change brought down the single party regimes, military regimes, and ushered in his place multi-party democratic system for governance on the African continent. So the problems of Africa must be seen in that context. Uh, we have the, the conflict, the conflicts were as a result of bad governance on the African continent. We have a next door in our country, Kenya, Somalia, which was misruled by one dictator called Siad Bari, who was eventually forced to leave the country in Tatas, and from that time the Somali government as people have never known a government for the last 19 years. We have that the problems in the Great Lakes region, in Rwanda, in Burundi, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, in the Sudan, and you can name it. But thanks to the struggle of the African people, change has now come onto the African continent. A new era is emerging on the continent. We are now in the state of transition. Several African countries have now held several multi-party elections. The civil society has emerged. There is also vibrant free press in a number of African countries. It is now possible to harness the human and natural resources of the African continent for the development of Africa. We have a serious problem in Somalia, where you have an armed uh, uh, militia group called Al-Shabaab, that is enjoying the support of international terrorist organizations. 
that want to take over power. The situation in Somalia is so great that it requires urgent, constant, constructed international response. It has given rise to piracy on the, around the Cajon of Africa and the whole of Indian ocean series. There is exodus of people from Somalia coming across the borders into Kenya. We have a refugee crisis in our own country. A camp that was designed to contain 90,000 people is now holding over 275,000 people. This is also affecting the security in our own country. Because we have also a lot of um, ammunition or arms smuggled into the country which are in the wrong hands. So this situation requires a, a concerted, as I've said, international response. There is a subject of climate change. Africa is actually a victim of actions which have been taken elsewhere, mainly the developed world. Africa is paying the price of the responsible actions which have been taken elsewhere. But the effects are devastating. In Kenya, we used to have eyes on the top of Mount Kenya and also on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. These eyes have melted. Because of the global warming, the increase of temperature, we are now having to cope with the, a spread of malaria, what is called the Highlands malaria, which was never the case before. The malaria has always been confined to the lowlands of our country. But as the temperature we have increased, malaria has migrated into highlands, causing serious fatalities among the population who do not have immunity. We are now living between two disasters, the uh, extreme drought and, the, and flooding. The El Nino invites La Nina. We now have had four years without any proper rainfall. As a result of this, there is severe famine affecting nearly 10 million of our population. The livestock is dying by thousands. This situation also requires urgent attention. There is the issue of migration of people from Africa to Europe. I want to disagree with Mr. Pratini that this is a European problem. It is a European problem and as well as it an African problem. It is a problem that we must resolve collectively. Why are the people migrating from Africa to Europe? Because people are looking for greener pastures. We have a responsibility to make the living conditions in Africa livable and attractive to retain the people on the African continent. So long as the situation in Africa becomes unbearable and untenable, people will vote with their feet, they will take risks to come to Europe.
and no army, even Napoleon's army and navy will stop them from coming to the European shores. We now have res We now have responsible regimes in power in Africa. All that Africa requires is the capital with which to transform the resources that we have into wealth. And Africa does not need aid or charity. Africa Africa needs trade and investment. Give us access to the your markets so that we can be able to sell what we produce in Africa. And we also invite Europeans to come and invest on the African continent. The kind of stimulus uh, uh, package that we are looking for is meant to jumpstart this economy, which have been affected, as I've said, by global warming, by the international economic meltdown, and I'm sure that the G8 and the West have the resources which will make the difference to Africa. Let us let us work together as partners to make this world and this globe a better place for the entire humankind. Thank you very much. Thank you because we have understood what really what the meaning of being Afro optimist. And now the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Tanzania, Ubembe. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, first of all, I must admit and appreciate that this is the largest audience I've ever addressed outside Africa. It's a bit... I feel a bit scared but proud. Secondly, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Vice President of Sierra Leone and the Prime Minister of Kenya for a very elaborate presentation that they have given. And they have made my work very easy. I will just emphasize on some issues which I find to be very important. On a general note, it is gratifying that this excellent discussion on conflict, poverty, peace, democracy and the human rights in Africa is taking place now and here in Europe, when everybody of us and you needs a clearer understanding of what is taking place in Africa, because it is that knowledge that will make you able to change Africa. Mr. Chairman, Somalia is both a failed state and an ignored state. It is a failed state because it has a triangle, it, it has a triangle of a crisis. 
poverty, civil wars, and the piracy. All of this combination of crises requires collective world response. Here is a government whose leader stays in the bunker and the cabinet minister is in Kenya. It is a failed state. And we must all be sympathetic. The African Union, the African Union has decided to send 8,500 troops to Somalia to address the issues. But until now, it is only Uganda and Burundi that have contributed 4,500 troops in Somalia. We have a deficit of 4,000 soldiers required on the ground. Countries such as Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, and Malawi have pledged to contribute to those troops. But this should not make the United Nations evade its responsibility. It is the duty of the United Nations to be present there. Africa is not an alternative to the United Nations system. The AU is there only to complement the efforts of the UN, and it must be there. The second issue that I wanted to, to introduce to you is the, is, the, is the resurgence of military coups in Africa. You may wish to, rec to recall that in the 60s and the 70s, and, and the first quarter, quarter of the 80s, 32 military coups were staged in Africa, but in 15 countries. And in those 30, 32, uh, 32 coups, 12 heads of states and the government were assassinated. It was a big problem that the AU addressed, and this question and this problem came to an end. But over the past four, over the past one year, four countries, four countries that is Mauritania, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, and Madagascar staged military coups. And they called them good coups. But the AU is saying we don't have any good coup or bad coup. They are all coups, and they must be condemned whenever they happen. I'm, I'm speaking and begging to the European Union to, su to support Africa in its bid to stop this military coups, and we need Europe to, to impose severe sanctions in these regimes that do not respect democracy. That is the way to go. I would also like to make a, a, a point on the UN reforms. As you all know, Africa is 53 countries. It is a continent of 53 countries, but yet it is not represented in terms of permanent membership in the Security Council. And yet 62% of all issues that are discussed in the Security Council is about Africa. What a contradiction. Certainly, certainly Africa requires to have at least one permanent seat in the Security Council. For, 
for two reasons that must be seen as such. One, as I've said, 60% of the issues are about Africa. But, but, but number two, it is the only continent that is not represented in the Security Council. So we request Italy together with the counterparts in the European Union to join Africa in demanding for a permanent seat in the Security Council. Finally, I would like to emphasize on what the Prime Minister of Kenya said about malaria in Africa. It kills millions of children every year. In Tanzania alone, the death that is resulting from malaria for children is 110 children per every 100,000 births. But it also kills pregnant women and pregnant mothers. Per every 100,000 pregnant women delivering, we, we lose 587 women because of malaria, because of malaria. Certainly we need a collective endeavor from the international community not to cure malaria in Africa, but to end malaria in Africa. A distinction, a distinction must be made here between curative medicines and the real termination of this disease called malaria in Africa. Some of us are now realizing that there are international companies that are trading in medicine, malaria medicine, for, for their personal wealth, and they are not interested in ending malaria in Africa. <coughs> Every time there is an effort to end malaria in Africa, They do whatever is possible to stop Africa from eradicating malaria because they know that their business will suffer the most. This is not fair. This is not fair. Some countries, some countries of the world have managed to stop malaria and to eradicate malaria. Why should Africa continue to be guinea pigs of combination drugs after drugs of malaria without addressing this measure to the root cause of it? I'm appealing to you all to help Africa not only to fight malaria, but to fight the companies that are perpetuating the stop from the eradication of malaria. I thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your attention. Grazie. Dora vorrei dare la parola al ministro. Thank you. And now the Minister for Security in Uganda, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Grazie, Presidente. Your Excellencies, distinguished panelists, Eccellenze. all of you distinguished participants, Grazie ladies and gentlemen. Signore, signore. First, may I present to you the greetings of President Yoel Museveni, who had been invited to come, but because of earlier commitments could not, and I'm privileged to be here to represent him. Secondly, 
I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this conference. I hope it will bring to the attention of Italy and the wider world the attention Africa deserves. Being, I don't know whether I'm the last speaker, I was about to claim that slot. Uh, being the last speaker has some challenges, but also advantages. When you speak, uh, most po last, most points have been made. So you either have uh, um, the opportunity to disagree or just say I agree with everybody and you end there. But let me make a few points, um, and, and I hope I agree with my colleagues. Conflicts, wherever they occur, do not take place in a vacuum. They are set in specific historical, social, economic, political, environmental, or other framework. Their root causes and dynamics can be identified, studied, and understood. This is true of conflicts the world over. It's true of conflicts in Africa. And obviously, conflicts are a major factor in development. For decades now, the world's picture of Africa is of a continent perpetually involved in conflict after conflict. The global narrative on Africa has been shaped by the idea that African conflicts are endemic, that the African people cannot peacefully live together, and that the rest of the world needs to come in to help Africans learn to live together in peace. Indeed, the international community needs to come to the help of Africa in many respects. But not for the erroneous reason that African people cannot live together in peace. The main reason is that the genesis of the conflicts in Africa is rooted in external and internal factors. As you know, we have had conflicts relating to slave trade, conflicts relating to resistance of colonialism, conflicts of all types. I would categorize the causes of, of conflicts in Africa as three, mainly. There is underdevelopment, there is intercultural conflict, and more recently, there is a fight in self-defense against international terrorism. Under development, if what existed, what exists in Africa today existed in Europe, I am absolutely sure you would have similar conflicts. I have not studied the European history very well. I wouldn't be surprised if the conflicts of Africa today were the conflicts of Europe some centuries ago. If you are colonized, what would you do? If you are denied your human rights, what would you do? It's a natural phenomenon to fight for your rights. Therefore, as Africa became steeped in corruption, misrule, cultural bankruptcy, 
As Africa sank into, into social, economic, and political degeneration, there emerged a new type of conflict whose actors sought to overturn the decadent political <coughs> order in an effort to create conditions that would pave the way for sanity and a new thinking on the African continent. These conflicts can be described as struggles whose purpose was to remove the failed post-colonial state that were pushing Africa into further stagnation. I agree with His Excellency the Prime Minister of Kenya that Africa must answer for its actions today and we must not blame a colonial authority because we are independent countries. But the fact is we have a colonial history. Some of the misrule that we have experienced in Africa has its roots in the distortions of colonial history. Take Uganda as an example. And take Idamin as an example. Idamin was a colonial soldier. In colonial times, the army was led by the European officer and the soldiers were African. When we got independence, the European officer left and only African of soldiers remained. Like Idamin, Mobutu Seseseko, and uh, the one of Central African Republic, uh, Bokasa. This is like decapitating a head. You take off a head. And what remains is the body. Idi Amin had never been trained as an officer by the colonial force. Of course, colonialism was not the best class for teaching democracy. So when the European colonial master left, and the European military officer left, who, who remained in charge? Idamin. When Idamin took power, all of you knew what he did. Would you be surprised that anyone like that would behave in that manner? Of course not. Absolutely not. Would you be surprised that a man like Mobutu behaved the way he did? Because he had not been trained to do better. So, what we should do, and what we have attempted to do in Uganda, is to overthrow the colonial structure, completely restructure it, and reorient our thinking and our actions as a truly new African state, devoid of colonial distortions. Okay. Now, the second cause is, uh, as I said, intercultural conflict. Because if you look at the case in Somalia, maybe Somalia is not uh, very well known, but the more known is the case of Sudan. 
Because in Sudan, the conflict has been by people that have resisted an attempt by others to assimilate them. Because a handful of Arab chauvinists in Sudan have attempted to Arabize Africans. And it's a mistake to say that this is a religious conflict, because it is not. Darfur clearly shows that it is not a religious conflict, it's a cultural conflict. And the people that have an identity whose, which is threatened by another group of people have a right to resist it. The third conflict is, as I said, in defense against international terrorism. And the case in the point is Somalia. So, my conclusion is, when you talk about forgotten conflicts, what do you mean? It is, in my opinion, it is not that you don't report about it in the newspapers. It is not that you don't know about it. It is that you know about this conflict. You know the justification for the conflict. And you, the rest of you, the international community, sit back and let the people be devastated by conflict without taking any action. Our answer in Uganda has been, finally, that after restoring the state, in order to change the character of the state, we have fully invested in human capital, educating our people so that they fully are aware of their rights, so that they can more effectively fight for their rights, as you do in the rest of the world. Thank you. Adesso sono sicuro che siete rimasti qui in tanti anche per poter festeggiare Mario Mauro e salutarlo dopo la sua bellissima. I'm glad that so many of you are still here in order to celebrate Mario Mar Mauro after his brilliant campaign in Europe and we are ready to listen to him. It is clear that one of the main objectives of this uh, meeting, and I'd like to thank the organizers and Minister Frattini, is to show Europe, or to remind Europe of its history of more than 50 years. If you think of the videos on television and if you think of the press of during the years of the war in Algeria, for example, or in the colonial times, well, no one would have thought it necessary to involve the European Union in solving the problems of Africa. We were interested in Africa because in Africa many of our um, desires for power could be implemented. Following the great devastation of Europe in the Second World War, we forgot about Africa. What happens in Africa is something we don't care. In the last 10 years, I went to Africa 64 times, 20 times in conflict areas. The Africa that I would like to talk about today is the one I know, Sudan, for example, where 37 years of civil conflict caused 
2.7 million deaths, uh, and nobody knows about this uh, in Europe. Uh, the Africa I love, Malawi, Burundi, Burkina Faso, up to 30 years ago, they had a per capita income higher than China. Why do I want to tell you about all this? Because um, we, and I'm talking as a European, we in Europe have made a tremendous mistake. We have thought of replacing the colonial logic with the logic of aid. I'm a member of the Budget Commission of the European Parliament, so I have made some calculations. We have sent $300 billion to Africa in 40 years, and the growth rate was 0.2% every year. The average growth rate was 0.2% a year. What does this mean? In a wrong logic, of solidarity. What we have produced today is something like a fist in your stomach. It's like worsening the conditions of what is somehow sometimes described as a severe patient. I agree with Prime Minister Odinga. We don't have to be Afro-pessimist, but Afro-realistic, and we re really have to understand how we can help you, really. If the culture of aid is uh, only found in rock concerts uh, or solidarity in the entertainment industry, where the pop stars um, and the cinema stars or the rock legends support aid and the governments follow them for fear of losing popularity, then Africa and its problems are something like an accessory to be worn in gala dinners or gala events. But in practice, uh, this is not a true alternative to the old colonial logic. For a new logic to be there, we have to understand what is wrong in the mechanism of aid. International aid, if they finance corrupted governments, and if corrupted governments prevent the development of civil freedoms and the development of uh, transparent institutions, well, this discourages not only national and international investments, but this discourages the African individuals who don't want to be part of their own destiny anymore. When we decide to help Africa, we have to reason as a uh, a great uh, Italian writer, Manzoni, wrote. He wrote that the history is not only the history of the powerful and the great, but the history is also the history of uh, the most humble uh, and poorest. All individuals uh, hope that their lives uh, become better, that uh, their children uh, or their friends have a better future. So if a change takes place uh, at uh, individual level, then really you change a whole society, you change a continent, and you obtain the common good. And to really have an impact, uh, we in Europe must ask ourselves, what's the meaning of being colonialist today? As Minister Frattini said, we don't want to be colonialists, but there is a... But, you know, I'm member of the European Parliament, 
and we should support uh, the needs of the poor. There is a government, China, which bought uh, land in uh, Africa for a, an area which is equal to Italy. Is this colonialism or is this an investment? You understand this if you go to Sudan, because around the oil wells, uh, for a hundred kilometers around an oil well, the people, the villages have to go away. They don't have to see, they don't have to be involved in an operation which certainly develops great economic resources, but not necessarily made available to the African people. So be careful. Is this colonialism or in an investment? What is it? And do we have to stay there and observe, simply look at what is happening? What is our responsibility in this respect? Look, our responsibility is not to teach the African governors what they should do. I'm really surprised by what I heard today from the speakers. The, the managing class is really an opportunity for the African people, if they are all like the people we have been listening to today. But, um, you know, if you help these people, you have to help them in the right way. The European Union is a great donor to Africa. It's an international institution which invests a lot to help countries produce bananas and rice, but 10 times higher is the investment to prevent those countries from selling rice and bananas in Europe. So what's the meaning of all this? We should speak more about Africa in Europe, but we Europeans must look at our history and at what we are doing for the good of Europe. And we must honestly ask ourselves, who are we? What do we want? What do we want to achieve? Because if we prevent people from coming to our country, we are not guided by love for people, but by charity. And we are not able to love the others. We are not able to support the rights of the others. We must have passion for Africa. We really ne must love all those people. The Uganda minister says it right, investing in human capital. Since the l largest resource is those inhabitants, those people who live in difficult conditions now, well, it is up to them. It is their task to rescue that continent. And we have the duty to show true solidarity, true solidarity. We have to show attention to the problems of that continent, which is which must invest serious resources with a clear goal, the common good, which is in, in the interest of Africa and in the interest of us all. Thank you. Mario certainly de deserves uh, our applause. The conclusions of this beautiful meeting today, and I'd like to once again thank our guests for traveling over long distances, for really conveying us true information and testimonies for us to better help this brother continent of ours. And we certainly have a need for more 
responsibility, a new responsibility. So Minister Frattini will conclude the meeting, and, th and, and I'd also like to thank you all. Thank you very much. I will just take one minute. We have learned a lot. We have learned to know the others, to know the real situation in Africa. We have listened to the testimony of great African leaders who are reassuring and comforting us. We are sure that the leading class is good in Africa, in the African continent. We have learned a lot from you, distinguished guests. We have all learned one thing, the future of the development of Africa and our future are closely linked. We cannot say it is somebody else's problem. It is our problem, the problem of our lives, our children, our generations. We have to grow together with that great African con continent. I have some special thanks to make. We are developing a new concept of developmental aid. This is what Mario agrees with fully. We have several times talked about changing the concept of aid. The aid policy should be centered and focused on the individual recipient, the people who see real benefit from what we are spending. When we read data, we read figures, and the expenditure of the European Commission for aid is distributed in such a way that only 30 euros out of 100 reach the final recipient, and the rest goes to red tape, to bribery, uh, travels, and uh, all the like. Well, this is not money that reaches the recipients. We have to change this uh, situation, and we have to really focus uh, more on those that are close to people, uh, the civil society and their extraordinary actions, the volunteers, uh, the extraordinary people who, with, the, with an Italian flag and with the love for Italy, go around in the world in order to help those in need. This honors Italy. It's a great merit that honors Italy everywhere in the world. We're now talking about Africa, but this is true also for other continents. There are volunteers, both uh, lay people and religious people, who uh, are close to those in need the embassies, the consulates, uh, the cooperation network uh, will increasingly be close to all those of you that work in close connection with the people in need. Thanks to all of you.